Yes, sir, I can. What do you want to do? And he said, well, we're going to cut one of your songs and I don't care which one. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Nobody had ever said that to me before and never has since. <laughs> but when Kenny said that that day, I stood all the way up to my full driver's license height, <laughs> which hurts my back at this age. I said, well, maybe I'm a bigger deal than I thought I was. <laughs> Turned out not to be true, but it was fun to think that just for a day or so. I got up the next day, I went over to the studio, thinking it's gonna be a big deal, you know. I go in the studio, figured, you know, big deal. Camera crew probably, you know, huge band. A lot of high fives. <laughs> it was just Kenny and his engineer and him. <laughs> Sitting on a wooden box, just like he is right now. Well, you know, there's never been a time I'm not happy to see Eric sitting on a wooden box because it's always better when that's there. But, but this particular day was a tiny letdown. You know, I was just kind of, I had a picture of more. <laughs> but I go in the studio and Kenny, uh, Kenny comes up and he says, Mac, what do you want to sing? I know a bunch of your songs. I said, it doesn't matter to me, Kenny. I know a bunch of my songs too. <laughs> He said, well, I don't have any kids yet, but if and when I have my own, I want to tell my kids what you said to your kids in that song down the road. Why don't we do that? Yeah. You sing the second verse. We'll make it a duet. So 45 minutes later, we had run that song about three times, just a couple of buddies on guitars and Eric on his wooden box. And that's all that's on the record. Just the three of us. That's all that's on there. And I remember backing out of the studio an hour later saying, man, sounded kind of good. I think if it didn't have me on it, it might be a good I started trying to figure out ways to bribe myself off the record. So, uh, But it turns out I underestimated Kenny. He was able to drag me all the way up the charts like an ankle weight. You know? So we had a number one record and we had a Grammy nomination and I got to sing it at Lambeau Field and all these great football stadiums and so many good things. great things came from it, but my favorite thing about this song, though, is still the way I felt before the sun came up on Christmas morning of 1987, knowing that I had a really clear picture of family and how much it matters, and this is down the road. When I was a boy, four houses down from me was a family with a lonely child.
Mixing Jimmy songs in with uh, with my other stuff here lately, I've been trying to add a little bit of uh, what I call coral reefer insider information <laughs> to the show. Because the whole touring group is our second family. The crew, the band, everybody that works with Jimmy from the bus drivers and the truck drivers all the way through to Mr. Utley at the top of the chain is people, <laughs> the people that he handpicked that because he loves them. And because he wants to be associated with them and that's so all of our crew and band we're all uncles and aunts to each other's children that's uh, it's just a it's been, it's been a wonderful existence and it will continue to be as soon as we figure out how to do it but that being said when we play and you guys you guys have been to a bucket show right <laughs> well, what happens at a bucket show, and you don't need me to tell you, but we, we throw everything we got out there to you guys, and you give us way back, way more back. It's this big exchange of energy, a big, a big alternating current of positive, of fun, of good, goodwill toward men, all of that stuff. It's all in there, and, and, and women. <laughs> I don't want to leave anybody out. <laughs> But uh, no, it's, it's, it's all good. And, and when we get off stage from these shows, we're wired to the gills. <laughs> we're not going to sleep for another five, six hours. And Jimmy learned this out early on. He learned it and, and he decided what we should do practically is, <coughs> since we're wide awake, go on to the next town that we're gonna play. So we, we leave and, and while we're wired, we get ourselves to the next town and we have a full day fill day to spend at the next city and that's he's smart that way and it also pays to have your own awesome airplane <laughs> to get that done but as we're riding on that awesome airplane wired to the gills after these shows we have crazy conversations and this particular song was born of one of those conversations post show I don't remember exactly where we played but we started talking about movies and there might be some people under the influence of various unhealthy food and shots and gummies and you never know what's on the plane you know, but, uh, but we're having goofy goofy conversations and we're talking about movies and somebody started bringing up sequels to movies and how they're generally not as good as the original and that's the truth pretty much and somebody else said well are there any sequels to songs anybody know a sequel to a song and I could think of one nobody else could think of one but Jimmy's like well why don't we write one? <laughs> and if Jimmy asked you to write a song, you're probably going to say yes to that. You know? <laughs> but I'm a little daunted by the fact that writing sequels, you know, it, they're usually not as good as the original. I said, well, what? so what do you want to write a sequel to? And he goes, well, let's write a sequel to Come Monday. Such a good song. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's not exactly a low bar to clear yourself. You know? That's a... Uh, he said, well, who better than us? We know the people that that song's about. It was about, you know, his, his lovely wife, Jane, and his, his friend, Ruby, and they're, they're uh, you know, he said, we, let's do it. So we did. And it's not as good as the original. <laughs> but it's not bad. It's good. It's really good. Love it, Mac. We love it. Oh, well, I appreciate that. But it's available for loving. <laughs> Just because it's not as good as the original doesn't mean we don't want you to love it. <laughs> and we, we, we used a line from one of our fellow coral reefers, Dear Departed Ralph McDonald, one of the greatest musicians ever. 
Ralph had his own way with words. He wrote, well, he wrote Just the Two of Us. He wrote Where is the Love. He wrote some great songs. But this particular night, this was not a song. This was just a line he said at a late night diner when Ralph and Robert Greenwich and Doyle Grisham and myself were having unhealthy food as a reward for having played a show. <laughs> and it was not particularly good food, but we we're grateful to get it at two or three in the morning. And the waitress, who was sweet as she could be, made the mistake of asking Ralph how everything was. <laughs> Ralph never said anything except exactly what was on his mind. She said, how was everything? <laughs> And he smiled, that beautiful smile that he always smiled, and he said, that chicken died in vain. <laughs> How do you not put that in a song? This is the coast of Carolina. Restaurant, we artfully complain. Groovy tells the waitress that his chicken died in vain. Most every day goes by according to design. Live this dream, still it seems I have you on my mind from the bottom of my heart. Off the coast of Carolina. Start. I believe we found our stride. The walls that won't come down. We can decorate or climb and find some way to get around. Cause I'm still on your side. Don't on the bottom of your Eric, squid the band again. 
<laughs> happens every night. I don't blame him. I've been a solo act for 35 years and I've broken up about three or four times. <laughs> This, uh, this is a cheating song I'm going to play for you now, and I don't write many cheating songs, because that's a really competitive field. <laughs> My buddies in Nashville have got it down. They fight the music row traffic in the morning just for the privilege of working on a cheating song until about lunchtime. Then they drink a couple of long neck beers instead of lunch and write a drinking song in the afternoon. And that's a day in the life of a songwriter. If, uh, I've never been able to pull that off. I'm envious of my buds that do it so well. But this one uh, came to me differently. I just was the guy that was up late one night and I played that chord, weird A minor nine chord there. And this song just fell out of my mouth like drool. I couldn't hold it in. It was written in the amount of time it takes to sing. Just literally three minute right. That's happened maybe three times in my life. Uh, and I'm not smart enough to do that. So I know that when that happens, it's a gift. And I'm grateful and I acknowledge the source. I just happen to be the guy that was up late. And it's after the fact, after I had this song, after it fell out of my mouth and I was looking down at it. I examined it a little bit. <laughs> And it's a little different than the standard cheating song. Most cheating songs just kind of have one way of looking at things. Just one vantage point, like, you did me wrong and I'm on my way to purchase a weapon. <laughs> or maybe, maybe I did you wrong and I hope you're unable to locate a weapon. <laughs> but, but it just sort of sees it one way. This particular song, was the first one that I had ever encountered uh, uh, among cheating songs that, that made an effort to see everybody's vantage point, that, that have a little empathy for everybody involved. And for that, I'm grateful. I didn't do it on purpose, but that's. Uh, but it, I get to. I get to have my name on the copyright. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> when they put me in the Songwriters Hall of Fame in Nashville, they played this song as an example of the fact that I get it right. Every day. She likes adventure with security And more than one man can provide She planned adventure feeling sure that he Would not be home till after five He turned on the lights and turned them off again So confused, 
But I can finally see how much I stand every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. She played all day singings. She played these things that the Southern Baptists have called associations where it's kind of like a preaching competition where you, you sit through like nine sermons in one day <laughs> and separated by one song at the beginning and one song at the end and a piece of fried chicken in the middle. <laughs> and as far as I know, she played, she played all the weddings, she played all the funerals, and I don't believe she ever charged anybody a nickel. She just felt like it was her gift and her, uh, her job as, as a gift. And she forced me into piano lessons in the third grade, and she likes to see some dollar value coming back. <laughs> and she always felt like if I play something on the piano, it adds a cultural content to my presentation, <laughs> which is lacking otherwise. So, uh, you know, she's not here tonight, but she's always had a habit of knowing what I was doing either way, so. <laughs>
Everybody's got songs they wish they had written, you know. <laughs> That's one of my favorites of the world. Uh, and it was written on assignment for a movie. <laughs> Supposedly, Harold Arlen and Yip Harburg, who were the writers of that song, uh, were working on it and they were stuck on the last line. They couldn't get the last line. And they were supposed to go have lunch with Irving Berlin, who's pretty good on his own right. <laughs> And, and supposedly Irving came in and they said, let's go to lunch. And they said, well, let us get this last line, we'll go. And they keep beating their heads against this last line, it won't happen. And they try this, try that, try this, try that. And the story goes that at a certain point, Irving Berlin just raises up and says, when happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why can't I? Let's eat. <laughs> I really hope that's what happened. <laughs> and the reason that I had to tell that is because I had to tune this guitar again. <laughs> But I didn't make the story up. I've heard that from more credible people than myself. <laughs> the reason, if you've been to any Jimmy shows in the last four or five years, you've heard this song in the middle of the show. And the reason that it goes in the middle of the show, well, it's two reasons. Jimmy really likes it for one thing. I gotta give him credit, he really did like this, but he also needed a pee break in the middle of the show. <laughs> And so did the rest of the band. <laughs> and honestly, so did I, but I didn't get one. <laughs> Which accounts for kind of the blues faces that I make in the last third of the Buffett show, you know. I'm not really a blues castle. But it's a beautiful little instrumental that Dwayne Allman wrote a long time ago and that I struggled to figure out. The whole time I was growing up in Mississippi, sat on the porch, beat my hands against the guitar, could never get it. Still don't really have it all the way. I got it up to about 65, 70%. It took me a long time to get there. I went from North Mississippi to the honky tonk bars on the Tennessee line. My hometown was, if we were a dry county, you had to go across the Tennessee line to get to a honky tonk to buy a beer. I started playing in those honky tonks when I was 13. Nobody in those honky tonks knew how to play this either. Got a little bit better than that still and started playing in the studios in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, which is where Dwayne Allman that wrote this song cut his teeth. And uh, I knew some of those folks could explain to me why I couldn't figure this song out. And sure enough, when I got up the nerve to ask, they did. They told me, it's two guitars, you idiot. <laughs> I'm not especially bright, but I am stubborn. And that's what earned me the right to buy Jimmy a pee break in the middle of the show. And this, this is a lovely little melody that I keep working on. It's Dwayne Allman's Little Martha with a Big Mac on the side.
finish ten in life. <laughs> This is, uh, I, I wrote this for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to try to play gospel piano like my mom because she was really good at it. Uh, but two, I wrote it for my group of folks that made my life better. I've got, everybody's got a group of people that, that your life is better because you cross paths with. We all have that. And uh, I got a particularly great family. I got a great second family with the Coral Reefers. I've got so many people that have looked after me and pointed me in the right direction over the years and I didn't always take the advice but uh, but I'm so much better off than I would have been had I not crossed with those folks. This song is about that group of folks. I'm thinking about one of them in particular here lately. Mr. Buffett took me under his wing way, uh, way before I deserved anybody to put me under their wing. He believed in me way before I believed in myself and I uh, I'm dedicating it to him tonight, but while, while I'm going to play this song for my group of folks, you think about your group of folks. You, you've all got one. You think about yours, I'll think about mine. We'll meet in about three and a half minutes and see if we don't feel a little better. This is uh, On Account of You. But that alarm clock goes like it does most every morning. Lots of room for improvement, but I'm a whole lot better on the count of you. Pour me a cup, thumb through the paper. It sets me to thinking, what's this word? Just a work in progress 
Lots of room for improvement, Lord knows. <laughs> but it's a whole lot. I'm saying I'm a whole lot better on the count of you. Excited singing down in Muscle Shoals blew my voice out. And I had to postpone a couple of shows. Still weak. I'm still in vocal rest. I apologize a little bit. I'm a little bit hoarse. You're going to get everything I got. Yeah. We've been. Uh, this one's been in the show for a while. I'm just saying that because I'm probably about to blow it the rest of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. 
appreciate how wonderful you guys are. Uh, this room and you together are a combination that's impossible to resist. I'll come back anytime they let me. We have lots of songs. I can't sing them all tonight, but we've got lots. Closing in here, we got your tonight. Yeah, I'm getting better. I'm, I was the rookie of the year last night <laughs> for the 30th year in a row. <laughs> I wrote that for you, ma'am. <laughs> Hopewell, Virginia tomorrow night. I'll see what I can get back by then. This young lady requested this song I wrote a long time ago about our, our propensity in North Mississippi to, to decorate our lawns with jump cars. Yeah. It's not just North Mississippi, is it? That's just the only place I ever was, but it turns out it's everywhere. But you can't drive by something all your life and not end up with a song about it. That's what happened here. I make Eric drag this particular piece of percussion all around the world. Just to play on this one song. It's so much fun to watch it going through the TSA at the airport. I mean, how is that not terrorist stuff? That's not terrorist. Anyway, it's 
got a long story, but since I'm going to sing it, I better not tell the story. We're just we're, we're going to do junk cars here. I will say that our buddy Jimmy's Jimmy's dear friend and mine, long gone great singer songwriter, Mr. Gamble Rogers. Uh, he told me one time that he had an uncle who he felt like was the king of all rednecks. And I said, that's not even possible, you're from Florida. <laughs> he said, no, I, I think it may be. And I said, well, explain it to me. And he said, well, my uncle has a Learjet on concrete blocks in his front yard. <laughs> I kind of got to give him that one. You know? All I got is junk cars. but it's voluntary this evening. I wrote a last verse in this song that has nowhere to breathe anywhere in it. It's a particular problem for me because I've come from a long line of short-winded, overweight, high blood pressure, smoking unfiltered cigarettes in utero Mississippians. It ain't likely is what I'm saying. Folks have assembled here on the Thursday evening at the Ram's Head, and the very least you deserve is a good gospel trial since Eric brought his hubcap all the way from that. So I'm going to take as deep of a breath as my advancing age and declining health will allow, and we're going to see how it goes. One, two. You got a condo, condo, mobile home, and a beach car, and diver, and Eric Duncan on auto 
Elizabeth Barnes. Exactly a year ago, we began working on the, this uh, this album, the, the final Jimmy Buffett album. It turns out we didn't know it was when we started it. And this time a year ago, we had exactly zero songs. <laughs> Jimmy's pretty confident. He's like, "Oh yeah, we'll we'll have, we'll get them." <laughs> Mr. Utley and I, the, uh, the guys in the, what we call the produce section, <laughs> we were a little concerned. <laughs> Jimmy's like, it's going to be fine. And you know, he was almost always right. And he was right about this. We, uh, we, from this, this time of year ago, we had no songs. In the third week of January, we cut 14 tracks that are the songs that are on this, this final album. And 
and it's really good. I'm so proud of how hard he worked to make this a good record. You didn't have to do that. He put so much into the writing, and he didn't have to do that. He hasn't had to prove himself as a songwriter in a long, long time. But, uh, but he did it on this. And since we're not really going to get to tour the record, I felt like I, uh, at the very least, should should learn something to represent so you guys would, would know a little bit of how much joy and, and sweat went into the final thing that we're leaving with and, uh, and that we're all left with. I get to listen to it too. This is, uh, this is one of my favorite things off the record and I, I just sort of barely know it, but it's, it's such a cool, as a songwriter, I got to look up to Jimmy for this one because it's something that uh, our old Navy buddy told him. He went and did this uh, this training thing that the Navy SEALs did, not the full treatment, obviously. But, uh, but as a senior citizen, he went and did the deal where they they drop you in a, in a like the, the cabin of a helicopter down into 20 feet of water with full gear on, and you have to figure out where in the hell you are. And, uh, and Admiral Best uh, put him through this test, and, and Jimmy said, well, give me some advice. And he said, well, you're not going to know where you are, and you're going to try to figure out how to get out of your gear and unbuckle and all that. He said, just follow the bubbles. Bubbles take you where you want to go. Look up. And that is, think about that. If you think, put yourself in songwriter's shoes for a second. That's very specific information about a very specific situation that basically none of us are ever going to be in. But he took that and he put it into a song that I guarantee you applies to some aspect of every one of our lives. That's that's what a good songwriter can do. A 76-year-old man wrote this song. I can't do it justice, but I'm gonna do my best. This is uh, this is Bubbles Up. When this world starts a reeling from that pressure drop feeling, we're just treading water these days. There's a way to feel better, be well set to weather the storm till the sun shines again. When your compass is spinning and you're lost on the way, like a leaf in the wind, friend, hear me when I say, bubbles up, they will point you toward home. No show you the surface, the plot and the purpose, so when the journey is long, just know that you are loved, there is light up above, and joy, there's always enough. Friends who are jolly when melancholy knocks, sometimes they let her in to sit and share stories of flops and the glories that ain't half as bad as the bands. Sometimes living's a struggle, multiply double, but we love it too. Much for the party to begin. Bubbles up, they will point you toward home. No matter how deep and how far you roam, they will show you the surface, the plot, and the purpose. The soul in the journey. Just know that you are loved. There is light up above. And joy, there's always enough. Bubbles up. So let's pop a cork for the rough and the right. And the bright blazing day. And the sweet star in Thank you.
you toward home. No matter how deep and how far you roam, they will show you the surface, the plot, and the purpose. So when the journey is long, just know that you are loved. There is light above and joy. There's always enough. Bubbles up. That's a pretty fine song. That's a pretty fine song. up a really nice place to end the show and I'm still standing here <laughs> that I have a lot left to learn as a performer uh, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pretend we're all gonna pretend we all got imaginations here we're gonna pretend that Eric and I left the stage and you guys clapped for about three minutes <laughs> shameless entertainer, right? <laughs> you gotta learn something from the guy. Well, uh, this, this, this is really, this, this is our encore. <laughs> and, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a bittersweet story, but when, when something, when something hits you the way losing him hit me, it means you had something really, really good for a really long time. Yeah. And most of that good is still here. So I'm, I'm going to tell you my story not as a sad story, just as, a, just as something I'm blessed to have. But the last week of August, I was uh, working on George Strait's new record in Nashville. We were having a big time, and I got a telephone call that I needed to come up to Long Island and say goodbye to Jimmy. And nobody wants to do that. Uh, but Mr. Utley and I flew up there and drove out to Long Island and went in to see him, and the kids were all there with him. It was exactly one day before we left this world. And that we were the last people that he allowed in to, to say goodbye. And, and he was smiling, that same smile that you never saw him without any time you ever came to a Buffett show. If he was the happiest or the sickest, whenever you saw him, it doesn't make any difference. He smiled that smile because he was happy to be on stage playing for everybody. If you heard him on the radio, he was smiling on the radio. That's the way the guy was. So whatever, you never know exactly, if you, if you didn't get to meet him, let me just tell you, he's exactly the guy you thought he was. He was the same all the way, 24 hours before he was gone from this world. He was smiling big as all get out, saying, what a hell of a ride. Uh, and I went there to, to say goodbye, and I had a hard time making anything come out of my mouth, because I, you take a guitar away from me, and I'm not very good at talking. <laughs> I'm glad you guys haven't had to witness that. <laughs> but. Savannah Buffett, Jimmy's lovely oldest daughter, saw me struggling and she picked up his guitar and handed it to me. And he was sitting on the bed. And I noodled around, played him a little bit of a couple of his melodies. 
and I played him the uh, the first song that he and I ever sang together. And as it turns out, the last song that he and I ever sang together. And uh, this is what I played him. shows I always go stand at the back door like a mediocre Baptist preacher and say hello to everybody <laughs> at this particular point in time I'm on vocal rest and we've all got some kind of bug we're giving one another back and forth we can't do that tonight because we love you <laughs> but they got to forgive me for making them sick you know so uh, Dwayne our sound man Eric I made them both sick uh, oh. that, yeah <laughs> it's, it's not that hard to get sick of me, but, uh, <laughs> but Mr. Buffett is here, and we're going to sing with him on the way out. This, he wrote this song about turning 40 years old, and we're going to all sing here. You guys can really sing. I'm impressed.
Watch the men that rode you Switch from sail to steam And in your belly you hold the treasure That you have ever seen Most of them dreams Most of them dreams Yes, I am a pirate, 200 years too late. The cannons don't thunder, there's nothing to plunder. I'm an over 40 victim of fate, arriving too late. Arriving too late. I've done a bit of smuggling. I've run share of grass I made enough money to buy Miami but I pissed it away so fast never meant to last never meant to last and I have been drummed out for over two weeks I passed out and I rallied and I sprung a few leaks but I gotta stop wishing down the rock bottom again Just a few friends A bunch of pretty good singing friends in Ram's Head in Annapolis on Thursday night. Thank you.